Thank you for joining us. Again, my name is Jennifer Hammondy, and I'm the chair of the National Transportation Safety Board. Uh, with me today is one of our newest board members, Alvin Brown. Uh, member Alvin Brown uh, is, this is his training launch, and uh, we have our investigator in charge, who we call the IIC, uh, Marcel Muse. As I mentioned, we arrived on scene yesterday at about uh, 6 a.m., but the team uh, came in from across the country throughout the day. It was really a day to get our bearings. Uh, we uh, set up our family assistance uh, program and also began to develop our investigative plan and request documents that we need in order to conduct our investigation. Today is really uh, the first full investigative day uh, on scene. We were able to board the vessel. I boarded the vessel around noon along with our uh, marine safety team and our highway safety team, and I can talk about that in just a bit. But I want to take a moment before I discuss our, uh, some of the factual information we've been able to identify and uh, speak to the families. On behalf of the National Transportation Safety Board, I just want to extend our deepest, deepest condolences. Uh, you are in our thoughts and prayers as the days, months, uh, uh, years ahead go forward. Uh, certainly, we are focused on you. Our entire mission is to save lives, and our aim is to prevent this from reoccurring, and we are so so very sorry for all uh, that you are going through. Uh, it's unimaginable. And uh, truly, uh, we think about you throughout this investigation. So as I mentioned yesterday, for those who may not be familiar, the National Transportation Safety Board is an independent federal agency. We are charged by Congress with investigating every civil aviation accident in the United States and significant events in all modes of transportation. That includes bridge collapses and it includes uh, marine accidents and incidents. Our mission is to determine why something happened, how it happened, and to prevent it from reoccurring. Again, to save lives. I want to talk a little bit about how we conduct an investigation, but I think it's really important for folks to understand that we will not analyze any of the information we are uh, collecting. We will not uh, provide any sort of findings, conclusions, or any safety recommendations while on scene. Our entire focus on scene is to collect the perishable evidence. That's documenting the scene, it's taking photographs, it's taking any sort of electronics or components, uh, whatever goes away once the scene is cleaned up. We need to collect that information for our investigation. When it comes to digging through uh, inspections, uh, maintenance records, that can be done when we leave. Right now it's focused on the scene itself. So to conduct our investigation, we work with parties to the investigation. Parties to the investigation provide us technical information. This is factual information that we use as part of our fact finding. So if we need uh, bridge inspection data, we would ask, say, the Federal Highway Administration uh, or uh, information about Coast Guard inspections, we would ask the Coast Guard. So parties to the investigation are the United States Coast Guard, uh, Maryland Transportation Authority, the Association of Maryland uh, Pilots, and we've invited Grace Ocean Private Limited and Synergy Marine Private Limited. Grace Ocean is the owner of the vessel and Synergy is the operator of the vessel. Again, these parties are part of the fact finding. They do not conduct analysis with the NTSB. The NTSB does that independently on its own, uh, and then we do our own findings, uh, our own uh, probable cause, and our own safety recommendations. Now, in order to effectively carry out 
an investigation, we have experts throughout the NTSB in different areas. And so we break up our investigation into groups. Those groups focus on their particular areas of expertise. In this uh, safety investigation, we have a nautical operations group. This group gathers evidence to document the actions taken by the vessel, the procedures for the safe operation of the vessel, company oversight, waterway management, safety management, and regulatory oversight. Uh, that group would and has uh, collected uh, and has asked for information on, say, duty records, uh, licensing, training. Uh, they requested the crew list, so we were able to confirm that there were 21 crew members on board the vessel at the time of this accident, plus two pilots. That's 21 crew members plus two pilots for a total of 23 individuals uh, on board the vessel at the time of the accident. They also were able to obtain the cargo manifest. Now, the cargo manifest, we did bring in uh, one of NTSB's senior hazmat investigators today to begin to look at the cargo and the cargo manifest. Uh, he was able to identify 56 containers of hazardous materials. Uh, that's 764 tons of hazardous materials, mostly corrosives, flammables, uh, and some miscellaneous hazardous materials, class 9 hazardous materials, which uh, would include lithium ion batteries. Some of the hazmat containers were breached. Uh, we have seen uh, shear on, or sheen, sorry, sheen on the um, waterway. The federal, state, and local authorities are aware of that, and they will uh, be in charge of addressing those issues. But the NTSB, as part of our safety, rec our safety investigation, documents that uh, type of release, it documents the damage, and, and documents the type of materials involved as part of our investigation. We also have an engineering group uh, which gathers evidence to document the design and operation of engineering systems, including the vessel propulsion, steering, and power. The operations and engineering uh, group was able to board the vessel last night, and they did a walkthrough of the vessel, including the bridge and the engine room. Uh, they were looking for other electronic uh, components, any sort of downloadable recorders, any sort of cameras, any sort of CCTV. Uh, they did not find any of those things, uh, but uh, that search continues. Uh, they've also requested a number of documents, including maintenance and inspection history, uh, and are, a as we speak, uh, conducting interviews on board the vessel. Those interviews began at 1 p.m. this afternoon, and those are with uh, the crew members on board the vessel. And then again, I mentioned we did board again today at 1 o'clock. Uh, that was the, in, in pretty much the entire team, me, uh, plus Office of Highway Safety, Office of Marine Safety, Member Brown, uh, and uh, um, uh, looked at uh, the damage. Uh, we were able to take a look at peer protection. Uh, we looked at some of the damage to uh, the containers and certainly uh, the bridge structure. Now we have a recorders group, uh, which is responsible for locating, retrieving, and downloading any recorder or recorded information that may relate to the accident. We do have the Voyage data recorder. Uh, they worked on that all day to validate that information. They also have a printout of the alarms. That's the, the log. They still have to go back and look at that and validate that information at a later time. In addition to that, uh, we, our survival factors group uh, 
interviewed or discussed uh, with uh, the Maryland Transportation Authority Police uh, the timeline of events that occurred around the time of the bridge strike. Uh, though that two sets of information uh, we're putting together in a timeline that we will release uh, through our social media channels. But for right now, I'm going to ask Marcel uh, to go through the Voyage Data Recorder information that we have to share with you, as well as some of the information that we gathered from the police. Thank you, Chair. Information from the Dolly's Voyage Data Recorder, or what we call a VDR, was successfully recovered on the morning of the accident by the U.S. Coast Guard. It was provided to the NTSB upon our arrival. Approximately six hours of VDR data was provided to the NTSB. The recording included the time period from midnight to 6 a.m. By regulation, the VDR is required to record 30 days of history, and the NTSB is continuing to obtain more data. The times expressed below as recorded by the VDR and converted to local eastern daylight time. All information is preliminary and subject to final validation. The VDR data is comprised of audio from the ship's bridge as well as recordings from the ship's VHF or very high frequency radios. The quality of that audio varies widely because of the, um, the high levels of background noise and alarms. Additional analysis will be performed at the NTSB's lab to filter out the audio and improve its quality. Additionally, the VDR recorded limited sensor data. An example of that data recorded includes the ship's speed, engine RPM, ship's heading, and rudder angle, as well as some alarm information. NTSB engineers are working to identify and validate all of that data. The VDR recorded the ship's departure from Seagirt Marine Terminal at approximately 1239. It recorded the ship's transit outbound in the Fort McHenry Channel and the striking of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. By 107, the ship had entered the channel, and by 124, the ship was underway on a true heading of approximately 141 in the Fort McHenry Channel at a speed of overground of approximately 8 knots or 9.2 miles per hour. At 0124 and 59 seconds, numerous audible alarms were recorded on the ship's audio, bridge audio. About the same time, VDR sensor data ceased recording. However, the VDR audio continued to record using the redundant power source. At around 0126 and 2 seconds, <laughs> The VDR resumed recording sensor data, and during this time, there were steering commands and rudder orders recorded on the audio. At around 0126 and 39 seconds, the ship's pilot made a general VHF radio call for tugs in the vicinity to assist. About this time, the Pilot Association dispatcher phoned the MDTA duty officer regarding the blackout. Around 0127 and 4 seconds, the pilot ordered the dolly to drop the port anchor and additional, uh, ordered additional steering commands. Around 127 and 25 seconds, the pilot issued a radio call over the VHF radio reporting that the dolly had lost all power and was approaching the bridge. Around this time, ND MDTA data shows the following also occurred. Their duty officer radioed two of their units that were already on scene due to construction on the bridge, one on each side of the bridge, and ordered them to close traffic on the bridge. All, line, all lanes were then shut down by MDTA. Around 0129, the ship's speed over ground was recorded at just under seven knots, or eight miles per hour. From this moment until approximately 129, and 33 seconds, the VDR audio recorded sounds consistent with the collision of the bridge. Additionally, around this time, MDTA dash cameras show the bridge lights extinguishing. Additional analysis of the VDR audio in comparison with other time sources will be needed to determine the exact time of contact between the dolly and the bridge. 
At, at 129 and 39 seconds, the pilot reported the bridge down over the VHF radio to the Coast Guard. The NTSB will later convene a group of technical experts to review the entire VDR recording and develop a detailed transcript of the dialogue and the, events, and the event alarms as recorded. A few areas of, uh, that I just want to clarify. Uh, the data that we received from the Coast Guard, which was they were able to obtain on the bridge uh, by downloading uh, the information from the VDR uh, from midnight to 6 a.m. That's a standard time frame. They provide that Im immediately so we can see that time, a time frame uh, around when the accident or incident occurred, uh, knowing that we can go back and get the rest, uh, that there should be 30 days there. So this is the immediate information that they give us, uh, but it's not, I don't want anyone to think anyone, anything was being held back. That's very standard information. I do want to thank the Coast Guard for that because that was pretty immediate. It was done right away, and then they provided us with a uh, thumb drive that we were able to evaluate uh, back at our lab at headquarters. Uh, and I'm sure you will have questions on that. Um, I, I do want to also say I've, I've seen a lot of, of comparison as between the VDR and uh, CVRs and FDRs or black boxes on commercial airliners. Um, this is really a basic system. Um, an FDR would give you a thousand parameters. That's not this. Uh, VDR is basic. It is a um, snapshot of the major systems on a vessel. Um, and we have long wanted uh, more recording, more parameters to be recorded on a VDR. Uh, so that's ho hopefully something uh, that we can provide, uh, and uh, happy to answer more questions about that timeline. But before I do, I want to continue with what our team has done. Uh, our survival factors group, uh, their whole role is to examine the response. And so they were able to obtain dispatch logs from the Maryland Transportation Authority, the Baltimore County Fire Department, the Baltimore City Fire Department to begin to put together a timeline. And they will be conducting interviews tomorrow, including uh, with a few people uh, in the bridge area. Now we also have from our Office of Highway Safety a bridge structures group. Many know that the bridge was built in 1976. It has three spans. The main span is 1,200 feet. The entire bridge is 9,090 feet in length. The average annual daily traffic on the bridge is 30,767 vehicles per day. 30,767 vehicles per day. The bridge is fracture critical. It's a fracture critical bridge. What that means is if a, a, a member fails, that would likely cause a portion of or the entire bridge to collapse. There's no redundancy. The preferred method for building bridges today is that there is redundancy build it, built in, whether that's transmitting loads to another member or some sort of structural redundancy. Uh, this bridge did not have redundancy. There are 17,468 fracture critical bridges in the United States out of 615,000 bridges total. And that comes from the Federal Highway Administration. This bridge was in satisfactory condition. The fra last fractural, fracture critical inspection was in May 2023. We have not uh, been able to go through that inspection and all the documents, that, but that will occur after we leave uh, the on-scene portion. But we've also requested all fracture critical, routine, and under, underwater inspections of the bridge over the last decade. Once we receive that, we will begin to go through all of those documents. 
We've also requested information on peer protection on all MDTA, that's Maryland Transportation Authority, owned bridges. They have four uh, bridges where uh, we would have, uh, they would have information on peer protection, and we are looking at that. Our family assistance team continues to do their work and outreach to the families. Uh, they uh, provide them with assistance immediately on scene, connect them with the resources that they need, but then we continue to work uh, with the families throughout the course of the investigation leading up to the board meeting and many times for many years thereafter where uh, many work to get our safety recommendations implemented uh, to improve safety. So with that, um, <clears throat> again, when it comes to analysis of any of the inspection records or the records that we are requesting, that's going to take place later. Right now, we are focused on obtaining information, getting the perishable evidence, conducting the interviews. Uh, so I will take questions, uh, but I will call on you and uh, one question at a time. Uh, please provide your name and affiliation. Hi, Scott Thuman from ABC question about your work here and the efforts you have to make for the recovery that you're trying to get regarding information, things that are perishable, and all the challenges on top of that with the girders, the metal in the water, the difficulty of having a ship with hazardous materials. What can you compare this effort to in other scenarios you've dealt with in the past? I mean, it, it is a, it's a massive undertaking for an investigation. It's a, um, you know, it's a very tragic event. It's multimodal. There is a, a, a lot of information we need to collect, a lot that we need to analyze, many interviews, uh, many different components to the investigation, uh, but this is not new for the NTSB. We've conducted other investigations of bridge strikes, bridge, bridge collapses, uh, we have an amazing team of individuals who are focused on very specific areas of expertise, and so I have no doubt that we will be, be able to pull this uh, together uh, in, in hopefully 12 to 24 months. Uh, with that said, we will not hesitate again to issue urgent safety recommendations before that time if we need to. Pete. You said that there was limited sensor data from the Voyage data recorder, engine RPM heading, rudder angle, and alarm information. How upsetting is that to you, knowing that there were not more parameters recorded? So this is a newer, um, uh, the question is uh, the parameters on uh, the VDR and the limited information that Voyage da data recorders provide. I'll ask Marcel to add uh, to that, to my answer. Uh, this was a newer uh, model, uh, so it did have uh, additional features, uh, but it is very basic compared to, say, a flight data recorder uh, where we would have a thousand parameters. So it would be good to have that information, key to have that information for an investigation. Uh, I think Marcel can provide additional information on what might be missing. So, by, by this is a voyage data recorder, it's not a ship-wide system recorder. So most of the, the sensors that are being recorded are from the bridge, so things like GPS, um, the audio, um, rudder feedback, rudder uh, commands uh, are, are recorded on there, but not engineering, um, the temperature of each cylinder, power distribution uh, sensors, those, aren't, those things are not recorded on a voyage data recorder. And we're looking for other sources of data in the engine room that would give us that data. The VDR also does record snapshots of the radar and the electronic chart. We do have that. I just have one tiny follow-up, which is, would that have been able to tell what the source of the power outage on board the ship was? We'd have to determine that as part of our analysis in this investigation. Too early to tell. Hi. Uh, Phil Yakubuski here from WBAL in Baltimore. You said that uh, there were 56 containers of hazardous materials on board that ship. How many of those are in the water, do you know, and what's the timeline mm -hmm. to getting those out of the water and the rest of the containers, 
that are sitting on that ship in the Patapsco. Yeah, I did see some containers in the water and some breached uh, significantly on the vessel itself. I don't have an exact number, but it's something can, that we can provide in an update and certainly in our preliminary report, which should be out in two to, f two to four weeks. The timeline to getting those out of the water? Uh, that is not uh, something that the NTSB does as part of our safety investigation, but that is something that I would uh, refer to uh, the federal, state, and local authorities. Yep. Could, oh, sorry, Tom. May I follow on that question, and particularly on the WTOP? Could you characterize the level of concern about the hazardous material leak, the sheen on the water? I mean, should people be concerned about this right now? And is there anything being done to mitigate? Uh, the authorities are aware it's, uh, um, uh, of the materials themselves, uh, and they, I would just direct you uh, to them for those sorts of questions, Tom. Uh, Madam Chair, can, you, can I ask you to uh, give me again the time that uh, the pilot called for the tugs? I didn't get that as quickly as you happen to mention it. And the second of all, when the pilot called for the tugs, Confirming the ship had no tugs at all, helping it navigate through the waters before it hit the bridge? Uh, that's correct. The tugs help it uh, help the vessel uh, leave the dock and leave the port and then get into the main ship channel and then uh, they leave. Once it's on its way, it's a straight, uh, straight uh, shot through uh, the channel. So there are no tugs with. Uh, the vessel at that time, so they were calling for tugs. Do you have the time frame? Sure. The, the pilot made that call at 1, 26, and 39 seconds, Thank you. according to the VTR. Yes. Hey, Danny McEwen from the Washington Post. Um, two things. One, can you update us on the status of the ship workers? What's the food and water situation like, and how long can they expect to be there? And then two, did the ship have signs of power problems before the mayday call? Uh, we have heard, uh, there's a question on uh, the um, concerns about uh, power or uh, reports of concerns of power uh, outages on the vessel uh, prior to that moment of the bridge striking. We have seen reports of that. We've read reports of that. We've heard reports of that. That's all part of our investigation that we'll have to look into and verify. Uh, with respect, there was a question on uh, the food situation uh, with uh, the workers on board. Uh, they, they cook was cooking. Uh, when I got on board, it, it smelled very good, <laughs> and I was very hungry. Uh, so uh, uh, I don't have any other information other than that, uh, but we were able to engage with uh, some of the crew members and others uh, are part of the interviews that are ongoing. No information on how long they'll be there? On information on how long they will be there, that is not information I have at this time. Sir? Let me go same with, with, with WSA 9. You said um, there are reports of potential outages. Are we talking about days, weeks, months? Can you give us any kind of like, what time reference? About? For the outages on the vessel, uh, you're asking about outages on the vessel prior to this moment of striking the bridge. We don't have any information of outages of, uh, on board the vessel prior to that time. Uh, certainly, we are going to look at what we can get from the uh, VDR data uh, because there should be 30 days. Uh, so hopefully, we'll be able to find uh, something in that data if the entire 30 days is there. Uh, but we are aware of the reports, and that's something that we need to look into, Chris. Yeah. Uh, can you uh, sort of, you, you mentioned on when you were doing the TikTok that some of the audio was obscured by alarms, that alarms started sounding. Can you give us uh, some sense as to what, was, what that experience on the, the bridge was like in those moments? Was it a cacophony of alarms? Was it uh, calm? What, 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 what you're able to take from the recording? Sure. I, I actually don't have that information right now. Um, that's why we take the data back to our lab where we can filter out some of that background noise and some of those, uh, some of those alarms as well. Also, bring, up, bring in parties that will help us understand what we're hearing, uh, who's talking, if there's some foreign language. Um, that's why we have parties come in and join us to, and also use the software that we have 
back in Washington, D.C. to do that. We're not able to do that on scene here. So you've not listened to the recording? I have not, no. We, that's our recording uh, group, group that does that. And, and if I, I may follow up, just uh, your, what you experienced on the ship, the state of the, the ship, the bridge, the condition? Uh, what I what we experienced on the state of the vessel and the condition uh, is the question. I mean, it's pretty devastating, certainly, um, uh, seeing uh, not just uh, what's going on with the cargo containers, but just looking at uh, the what was a bridge span, three bridge spans. Uh, that is pretty much gone. Uh, that is... Um, it's just utter devastation. Um, and when I look at something like that, I am thinking not about the, the container ships that are coming through, not about um, traffic uh, getting back up and running on the bridge. I'm thinking about uh, the families who've lost loved ones and the families who are waiting to reunite uh, with loved ones and uh, what they must be going through. Uh, on the alarm information, just to add to that, uh, we have the logs, and we'll go through that. Uh, but when we, when we provide the transcript, a lot more will be on the transcript, which we will read out at, during, during the course of the investigation. Tom? Have you spoken to the pilot at this point? Uh, we are, the question is, have we spoken with the pilot? There, was, there were two pilots on board at the time. And those interviews are scheduled to, for tomorrow. And have you spoken to the ship's captain? Uh, one of those interviews occurred today, along with the mate and chief engineer and uh, one of the other engineers. I don't have a readout of those uh, types of, of those um, interviews because they are currently ongoing, and our team was still on the vessel when I came to the press conference. So, ma'am. Yep. Kristen Griffith with the Baltimore Banner. I, I know you said you guys aren't in the analysis phase yet, but can you uh, at least say if you're considering whether um, the, the cause of the power loss to the vessel has to do with contaminated uh, diesel fuel? Uh, we've, uh, the question is on reports in the media about uh, contamination in the fuel. As part of any investigation by the NTSB, uh, we look at the fuel system. We collect a sample of the fuel. In this particular situation, it would be marine diesel fuel, uh, but we still have to do that. That sample uh, will be taken, and we will analyze uh, the quality, any sort of contaminants. We'll look at viscosity. Uh, that'll be part of our investigation. Back here. Yep. On the timeline, uh, and the question is, how quickly uh, the crew was in touch with authorities? You have the time. Uh, the the call went out from the uh, the crew about the bridge being down at one twenty nine and thirty nine seconds, uh, and we have the bridge fall at about one twenty nine and zero seconds. The, our first indication of our problem was when the pilot called for tugs. Okay. So that was at uh, zero 01. I'm sorry. Uh, Hold on. At zero 01, 26 and 39 seconds is when the pilot called for tugs. That would be the indication. Okay. That's the indication of the first sign of needing help. How long was that after, after the, uh, the, the, the VDR stopped recording? One twenty-four and fifty-nine seconds. Thank you. Was there any controllability left in the boat after these alarms went off? And I mean, was there any hope? I guess is kind of the question that they could steer the ship back onto the lane. Was it out of control? Well, first of all, we and we've seen the recordings. We have data 
which is consistent with a power outage. However, we don't have information, factual information, that can confirm that powder outage. So we aren't there yet. We st that's why we are looking for more information on the ship. Yep. You have a video that pretty much shows everything that happened in this crash. How helpful is having how helpful is the video that shows what happened? Yeah, so uh, the video, uh, the question is how helpful the video is that we've seen uh, circulating uh, of the bridge strike. Certainly it is helpful, uh, but the NTSB has to focus on data that we are able to validate as part of our investigation. Um, the public, the world, uh, relies on us to be independent, thorough, fact-based, and it is meticulous work. Uh, but because we do that, we get to the right solutions as part of our investigation. Uh, we are very careful not to jump to conclusions, to speculate, uh, and so it's helpful to have. Uh, but what's really helpful is the information that we are able to validate, uh, and that takes time, and that will lead us uh, to the findings, probable cause, and safety recommendations that we'll issue. Yes? Tyree Stewart, WDAO. Um, can you tell me exactly the kinds of hazardous material that were in the containers that were breached and how much spilled, approximately how much uh, was spilled into the waterway? Uh, the question is the types of hazardous materials that were breached. The information I have uh, right, uh, right now uh, of, the of the containers of hazardous materials, the total of 56 containers, were there, uh, was, were those contents on what, what was in the actual breached uh, containers, we'll have to provide you more information on that. But in total, it was a number of corrosives, uh, a number of flammable materials, uh, and uh, we have uh, some miscellaneous, they fall under what is class nine, which is miscellaneous trans uh, hazardous materials, which w is where the lithium ion ba batteries would, you would be. The question is how, how much uh, uh, would be uh, in the waterway, how big the spill would be. First of all, we have to get to some of those containers. It's a pretty dangerous situation uh, in that area, and we, we can't go in there. Uh, I doubt any other federal authorities right now could go to see how much is left in the containers themselves. Last question. Beatrice Peterson, ABC News. Um, I'm just curious, had the ship regained power, and if the bridge wasn't destroyed, would the ship be able to move? Uh, that's a lot of assumptions. Uh, if, you know, for the NTSB, we, again, we don't speculate. Uh, we don't uh, make, make assumptions on the what-ifs. Uh, so uh, f right now, we are just focused on the facts and on what occurred in this accident to determine what happened to prevent it from reoccurring. And can you talk to me a little bit more about the safety challenges? Um, earlier today, Governor Moore said that they had to suspend the recovery mission mm -hmm. because it was unsafe for the divers to I was just wondering, are there any other challenges you guys are facing outside of the hazardous materials? Uh, the question is on the challenges for uh, our team. Uh, there's certainly a number of challenges. Today it was raining. Uh, I will say uh, what it requires to go to the vessel. The uh, MD uh, TA police uh, took us on a uh, a smaller vessel out to the uh, container ship, and we are uh, going up a Jacob's ladder outside of the vessel, all of us. Um, and uh, once we get up there, there are, is a lot to tra traverse. It's raining, it's slippery. Of course, we have the hazardous materials, uh, we have containers that are open. Uh, we certainly have um, structural damage everywhere, uh, so we have to make sure that we have our safety gear, uh, that we are focused on holding both handrails at the same time uh, and, and being safe in wet conditions, it, and it's cold. 
uh, that can be very difficult. And so safety is a top priority. Certainly uh, for us, it's a, a value for the NTSB, uh, but um, it is uh, very difficult. And I'll say, you know, just uh, being out there when the Baltimore um, City and Baltimore County Police today who were uh, doing a lot of the work on the recovery mission. I mean, it's cold. It's cold water. Uh, it's raining, and uh, you have current uh, and all sorts of um, uh, waterway challenges. So it, it it can be very dangerous. But listen, everybody is focused on the right thing, which is reuniting families with their loved ones. That has to be uh, our main focus. Everything else in the investigation can wait. Certainly, we are doing what we can do, but that is everyone's focus right now. Does Thank you so much. Power? Does the ship have power right now? Oh, right now, it cannot but move. It has power. They're not sitting in the dark, right? Yeah, yeah, they're not sitting in the dark right now, but it cannot move right now. That's a question on whether the ship can move. No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.